I love that song. Uh, if you remember last Sunday, I, we talked about what does it mean to be redeemed. We spent just a few minutes explaining what that's all about. And of course, we know in the big picture, it means that Jesus bought me back. Uh, I'd run away from him. I'd ignored him. And what Jesus did at Easter when he died on a cross, he paid the debt of all our sin. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. Uh, I get to be Joe Montana. Okay? Uh, Not by imitation. Again, if you weren't here last week, that makes absolutely no sense to you. All right? But uh, I get to be Jesus Christ. As God the Father looks at me, he sees his son. And that's who I get to be. And so when I have accepted, when I have taken my sin and I've gone to the redemption center, which is the cross, he changes out my sin for a waffle iron. Again, you had to be here last week, all right? We, we went, when our family took in our blue chip stamps, man, we got a waffle iron. I take my sin and he gives me his righteousness. I'm made holy and perfect in his sight. I didn't know they were singing the song. I'm going to do something for just a minute. Forgive me. This is completely unscripted. Um, what have you been redeemed from? What, what was your image of yourself before you discovered who you were in Jesus Christ? Anybody want to offer an answer? What were you redeemed from? What was that? Your shame. Yeah, so you were ashamed. Yeah, Mark prisoner and drug addict that's not your identity anymore is it mark yeah it's a child of god and a husband to a wonderful wife right that's your identity now what else self-worth feeling what i wasn't good enough are you good enough now milo yeah no, no jesus worked on it Jesus worked on it. You are good enough because Jesus was good enough. See, we've, we've, all, we've all been offered redemption. We've all been offered forgiveness. But it's not ours till we accept it. God doesn't force it on any of us. That's what I love about the shirts the women have that you can pick up if you ordered one already. Choose joy. Choose the way you choose joy is you choose Jesus because He is the source of our joy. And so it's a personal choice that you and I get to make. Nobody else can make it for us. I must I must say, Jesus, thank you so much for what you did for me. Come live within my life. I, I love, I love that song. Um, thanks for being here. Draw your attention towards the screen. We're gonna look at our morning announcements. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're glad that you're here. If you're a guest, we'd like it if you could fill out a connect card that's in the pew in front of you so that we can communicate with you what we do for the rest of the week here. We don't just do stuff on Sunday. Our goal here at New Hope Community Church is to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ with everyone that we meet. And here are just some of the activities that we have around New Hope that help us to do that. One of those awesome opportunities that we have here at New Hope is our monthly Prime Timers Luncheon. That is for those of you who are 55 years or older, that's 55 years or older, get to come and hang out and fellowship with each other. I hear the dessert table is amazing. Next month, you don't want to miss next month, next month we are going to have a carnival on June 12th, so make sure you're there for that, you put that down. This last week we had our Prime Timer Senior Luncheon and we have had an art contest and I just wanted to show you all what the winning picture was from table one so check this out you don't want to miss it it's gonna be an awesome event next month June 12th see you there it's that time of year again it's the pasta feed and that's our annual fundraiser for the fourth fifth and sixth graders to go to camp at Harlem they'll be going at the end of July but now is the time that we need to help them What we'll do is we'll sell tickets for the pasta feed that'll be out in the pavilion this week and next week and on the evening, which is next weekend. And there'll be raffle prizes available, uh, raffle tickets will be available next week. 
and we're asking you to bring pasta dishes and raffle prizes and the sign-up sheet going round today. If you could bring the raffle prizes on the Friday beforehand, that would be useful so we could put them all out ready for Sunday morning so that people can buy raffle tickets and put them in the selected gifts. We thank you for all your support on that and we hope to see you there next Sunday night. May 26th from 10 to 12 here at New Hope, there's going to be a crochet class. If you crochet or knit or even if you want to learn how to crochet or knit, feel free to come. Us at New Hope, we're going to team up with the youth ministry in Operation Christmas Child and send our knit caps all over the world. And so come learn how to knit a cap that we're going to stuff in the shoe boxes during Christmas time and bring joy to kids all over the world. That is May 26th at 10 a.m. Franklin Graham is coming to Fresno part of his 10 city Decision America tour and he'll be in Fresno on May 28th at the Fresno Fairgrounds at 7.30 p.m. Jeremy Camp is the opening artist for the rally. This is a very important opportunity for you to be able to invite friends and family that you may not feel comfortable inviting to church. They'll come to this event and really hear the gospel straight from Frank and Graham. I gotta save the date for all of you who are parents of teenagers or parents of maybe some kids who are almost teenagers, those fifth and sixth grade years. On June 23rd, we are gonna have an all day next level parenting conference just for you. We as the student ministries department wanna come alongside you and help you and equip you to be the best parents you can. So join us on June 23rd, put it on your calendars right now, pull out your phones, put it on your calendars, June 23rd, next level parenting conference it's going to be one that you don't want to miss if you've been wanting to get involved at new hope church there's plenty of opportunities to do that and this is a really good opportunity to meet other people while you're doing it you can go to newhopechurch.net go to ministries and then down at the bottom service opportunities and there's a whole list of opportunities for you to get involved here at new hope i just want to let you know of a couple things that are going on here at new hope on june 3rd these are things you're going to want to pay attention to. Typically, at New Hope on a Sunday morning, we have four Sunday services. One at 8, one at 9.15, one at 10.45, one at 6 p.m. You're probably sitting in one of those right now. Well, if you are in our 10.45 or our 6 p.m. Sunday night service, pay attention. There is a service time change for you. We will be starting at 11 a.m. on Sunday, June 3rd, and at 5 p.m., on Sunday night on June 3rd. So make sure you mark those times. New service times brings new exciting things. Um, make sure you mark that down. We're really glad that you joined us today. If you'd like prayer, please fill that out the connect card in front of you and put it in the offering. Prayer is a very important part of our ministry here. We hope that you experience and pass along the all sufficiency of Jesus Christ today. And if you are a guest with us today, please fill out one of those communication cards. Drop it in the offering when it comes by this week. We'll get that information out to you as soon as possible. To our ushers, I'm missing a clipboard that I would like to send around. So it's either in the back or over in the other building. If you can get it for me, that would be great. Uh, those service time changes, which probably doesn't impact you since you're in the 915 service, but on June the 3rd, our last service on Sunday mornings and our evening service will be a permanent time change, all right? It's not the only service we're having, it's just that last service moves from 1045 to 11, gives you all a little more time to get out of the parking lot as they're coming in or a chance to visit for a few minutes longer. And uh, then we're trying something new during our Sunday evening schedule as well. So please take note of that. All right, uh, you'll notice the baby bottles up here on the table. All right, with the, they got brand new baby bottles this year. We've been doing this for over 20 years. Every with, year, thousands in our community pick up a baby bottle. There's all kinds of weird things going on. Oh, oh, do we have a commercial for it or? Wow, all right. But anyway, we got brand new baby bottles this year. Uh, we've been doing this with them for over 20 years. This is a fundraiser for Pregnancy Care Center, a wonderful ministry in our area. Helps lots of, of, of young women and young men at a critical time in their life. And here's the way this works. Uh, you pick up a baby bottle before you leave. Uh, you can bring that on up, Carl. Uh, pick up a baby bottle before you leave. When you get home, 
put this in a place that you will see it. Every day when you get home, take the top off and then uh, reach in your pocket every day, pull out all the loose change, fill it up with change, bring it back by Father's Day, all right? That's the, the, the collection day is Father's Day. Now, you don't have to just put change in here. If you want to put bills in here, $5, $20, you can fill it full of bills, all right? Just not your PG&E or your AT&T bill, all right? Uh, you can also put checks in here. If you put a check in here, write, make the check payable to Pregnancy Care Center. One of the few times you make it out to the organization, not to the church. We, uh, they come by, collect all these bottles on the Monday following uh, Father's Day, and then they call us back after they count it all up and let us know how much they raised through New Hope Church that day. And churches all over the state of California are doing this. And so I uh, hope you can pick up one or two bottles and uh, bring them back, all right? Um, the sign-up sheets that are coming around are for two things on top. It's been around for a couple of weeks. This is for, is Mark in here? I saw him come in. Oh, there he is. Hi, Mark. Uh, what, what is the sign-up sheet for? Yeah, I love the way he says that because I think you all are going to feed me that night. I think he says the pastor feed, all right? But it's, it's the pasta feed. So I just want to think I'm getting fed that night. <laughs> I love the accent. It is so good. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so for the pasta feed, uh, you can volunteer if you've already done it. You don't need to sign up again, but you can help in a variety of ways. You can bring a pasta dish that night that will feed 10 or more. You can bring a salad, same thing. You can bring bread, same thing. Uh, you can bring multiple things if you would like to, or you can also bring something for the raffle that night, all right? And uh, just indicate what it is that you are willing to do. Uh, and so those sign-up sheets are going around. Underneath the uh, pasta feed is, for those of you who like to ride motorcycles, okay? I, I think that Tony and Debbie will not be involved in that trip. Tony and Debbie, it's good to see you out today, and we're glad that you're feeling better. All right, glad that wasn't serious. For those of you who still ride motorcycles, they're going to have a motorcycle ride on June the 3rd, and it's going to be after the 8 o'clock service. They're going to take off. They're going to Oakhurst, and they're going to have a breakfast at Pete's Place. All right, so you can sign up for either of those. Now, in terms of thank you, for the pasta feed, you can purchase your tickets for the pasta dinner out at the jams table in the pavilion. This is what I love. You bring the pasta, you bring the bread, you bring the raffle, and then you buy a ticket to eat the stuff that you bring, all right? It's, uh, it's absolutely wonderful, and this is a fundraiser. We have a record number of fourth, fifth, and sixth graders going to camp. We set a record last year of 20. We have 28 kids going to camp this year. That is absolutely awesome. Good things happen at, uh, at youth camp. Trust me, good things happen at youth camp. It's where I invited Jesus Christ into my life. And so we try to reduce because it is expensive. And so we try to help all of our families and our kids get to go to camp. And that's what the pasta feed is all about. Uh, let me highlight some prayer requests that are not in your bulletin, all right? Uh, and and it's, it's kind of a lengthy list. This has been a challenging week for a lot of families. I have turned the cooler down a little bit. For those of you who are fanning, it should start to cool off in here, all right? Uh, Terry and Dana Orr. Terry and Dana, wait, wave, just so people can put face and names. They're sitting right there. Been part of our church family for a long time. Um, their daughter has, a, had, has had a variety of health issues for the last several years. She has been through so many tests. She has been poked and prodded and investigated and explored. Uh, and it's been more of a process of elimination. And this week there's another important test. It's one more step in that process really of elimination, trying to get a diagnosis to it. And where, it, where, where the process of elimination is leading the doctors to is to a conclusion that she very well may have Lou Gehrig's disease. And so we want you to be in prayer for them. There is another one of those tests this week and we certainly want you to be praying for them and for her. Uh, Jim Levin Dusky, many of you have been praying for his wife, Mary Ann, for the last several months. As you know, right at the beginning of the year, we found out that she had cancer, and she's been going through uh, a lot of treatment. She's been doing very, very well. She's been here most Sundays in spite of the treatment. Uh, her son and daughter-in-law also attend here. Her daughter and son-in-law attend here. Uh, Dad, Big Jim, you'll see him around here. Jim has been in the hospital for four weeks he has had four surgeries. He has been ICU. He has become, uh, he's had sepsis during this time as a result of some of these surgeries. Uh, and the biggest concern for the family and the biggest challenge for them is Jim does not know Jesus Christ. 
Uh, Jim says he believes in him, but he's ne- he said, I don't know that Jesus wants me. And um, I want you to be praying for both Jim physically and spiritually. I had a good visit with him this week. I understand he's been upgraded out of ICU, and I hope that is the fact. But do be praying for him as they continue to go through this. Uh, Juliet Benson, uh, new in our church, new in a relationship with Jesus Christ, is experiencing some challenges and is also in the hospital this weekend. Uh, the Parkers, uh, Greg's dad, we prayed for him a few weeks ago, was in ICU at uh, uh, Veterans Hospital, and he got a message on Friday, I believe it was, that his son had had a heart attack. Did he get defined as a heart attack? Okay. So 38 years old, so Greg's been both sides of his family, all right, from dad to son. So be praying for the Parker family. Rachel Thomas in our church, who works at St. Agnes, got to be a patient at St. Agnes this past week. She had surgery, and she is recuperating well. Cherie Waxel, a regular attender at our 8 o'clock service, arrived at service this morning uh, in her own car. She left in an ambulance. Uh, She was having chest pains, and uh, her blood pressure and heart rate kind of went through the roof, and so she is at St. Agnes Hospital right now, and uh, hopefully we'll have some information later in the day. Please be praying for Cherie. And then I had a call this week from Ralph and Darlene Emery, part of our church family. Um, They were here for, they've they've been attending here for about two years, and they were so excited about the sermon series on heaven. And they were at the first one. They, uh, the next week, they were out to breakfast before they came uh, to the 1045 service. And on the way out to the car, he got a sharp pain between his shoulder blades, and it persisted. And so they didn't come to church. They went home. It persisted. They finally went to the hospital. Uh, at the hospital, they did a CAT scan on him. It was not his heart, but they did a CAT scan. The CAT scan revealed that his liver was like shredded cheese. And before it was over, he the doctor came in and said your internal organs are riddled with cancer we don't know if it's gone above the neck yet or not but you just you are riddled with it he said great doc thanks uh we're going home and uh they called their kids they shared with the kids the news and uh, then they called for hospice to come on monday and called for me to show up on tuesday and he said tim we are going to enjoy the days that god gives me uh i'm 81 years old We've been through colon cancer treatment already. They did a little radiation as an extra uh, precaution, and they put me on kidney dialysis as a result of that because it destroyed my kidneys. Uh, So for the last five and a half years, as we go three days a week for kidney dialysis, my wife and I wake up every morning. We look at each other and say, how do you feel today? I'm fine. I'm feeling fine. Great. Then we're going to enjoy life today. And he said, that is what we've been doing. He said, you know what? I was so excited to hear the the, the sermon series on heaven. He said, I'll try to send you some sermon material, all right, real soon (laughs) that you could use. The attitude of this couple is what every pastor dreams and desires of his church family. That as we face the idea, the eventuality of all of our own death, that we realize we're going to a better place, a better country. And so Ralph and Darlene know that, they are prepared for that, and they are facing this like champions. And so I want you to be praying for their family and uh, the rest of us who come alongside of them as, as, as they are headed for this, this, this ride. Um, we have services this week with uh, Kathy May's family and Peter Seeley's family. So if you'd remember both of those. And then uh, last but not necessarily least, sitting right up here on my right is a guy who had surgery as well. He didn't tell me about it last Sunday when he sat on that pew, and I found him in the waiting room waiting for surgery at the hospital. I've been known to do that, just roam through the waiting rooms of hospitals looking for church members, all right, who don't tell me. But actually, I found Larry and his wife in there, had a chance to have prayer with him before he went in, and obviously surgery went very, very well. It's also obvious that it wasn't plastic surgery. He looks exactly exactly the same way he did last week. (laughs) A little little less hair maybe today. All right. But anyway, we're glad that surgery went very, very well. Uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. If you'd come, please, would you join with me as we pray? Cooling off in here a little bit? People feeling better? All right. Anybody getting too cold yet? Okay, good. Let's pray. Father, this has been a most unusual week. It has been a week that has been filled with... um, uh, lots of surprises and some, some great challenges. 
and yet we have seen your sufficiency at work time and time and time again. There are some circumstances that are still out there. We don't know what the end results are, and yet, Father, we are seeing your handiwork and provision and sufficiency, and we thank you for that. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thank you. Father, we thank you that uh, this is a very special day, uh, a day that at some point in history past, uh, our nation has said we're going to remember our moms, whether still with us or whether absent from us. We are so grateful. They were the givers of our life, and so today we give them special thanks. And Father, I trust for those who still have their moms with them that this will be a day in which honor, love, and recognition is shared. We commit this to you in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Just before you guys take off singing, I got something yet to do, all right? Uh, number, no, you guys go on, Usher, yeah, Usher, take, yeah, get, get the money. No, no, just, just kidding. If you're a guest, I'm sorry, all right? I don't usually say much about offering, but yeah, go ahead with that. Today, as you know, is Mother's Day. And so to all of you moms, happy Mother's Day to you, all right? Uh, some, some of you... Some of you said, Tim, you really dressed up today. Well, I dressed up for two reasons today. Number one, it was cooler, all right? But first and foremost, the primary reason that I dressed up today is because it is Mother's Day. My mother always loved her son in a suit. And so this is for mom today. Give her a little smile from the other side of heaven, all right? Uh, she is probably saying, Tim, your pants are a little bigger than they used to be when I was here. And she's absolutely correct. Uh, but anyway, we, we do have a, a special gift for all the ladies here today, all right? Whether you are a mom or not, but you are a lady, we're glad you're here. You all have moms, every one of you. And we want to recognize you, young or old. We want to say thank you for coming uh, to, to, to be with us today on this Mother's Day. And I know some of you are here with your moms. And thank you for honoring your moms by your presence of coming with them uh, to their church today. We are so grateful for that. So uh, I'm going to ask for uh, some men. Dan, would you help us out? on this side, Greg, on this side. Um, I'm going to ask that you guys, that this is kind of heavy, that you pass it up and down each aisle on this side. Ladies, you have your choice, okay? There, there are refrigerator magnets, all right, in here that say either hope, love, joy, and they have a scripture verse on it, our gift for being here today, or if you would like an amazing grace for a woman's heart devotional book, all right? So you have your choice. Take whichever one that you would like. So if you would to... Yeah, yeah, pass it, uh, or, yeah, or, or you know what, count and hand them down. I don't know, figure it out, all right? <laughs> That on this side, Rick, would you would you give us a hand? All right, and I should pick some. Uh, yeah, you to, all of a sudden, I just went blank. We went shooting yesterday, and I just yeah, John. Thank you very much. Such an unusual name. All right, so <laughs> this is for this side. All right, this one's lighter. Okay, all right. So uh, anyway, distribute those, ladies. Thanks for being here, and. Well, what's up with heaven? That's what we've been looking at for the last few weeks, and we will for the next couple of months. Um, if you're part of our regular church family, you're part of God's family, you know that heaven is your eventual home. Um, if, if you are visiting with us today and you wonder, what's all this talk about heaven? I hope you'll enjoy some of what we have to say about it, but the, the reality is this. Uh, all of us are going to die someday. Uh, it comes young, it comes old, it comes sometimes with reasons like sickness or a disease. Sometimes it catches us completely off guard and unexpectedly. But the reality of life is we die. An important question for all of us to consider is what do we believe is on the other side of the grave? And for those of us who have placed our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, we believe that God has a lot to say about what our forever home is going to be like, and that forever home is a place called heaven. And you better hope that's not God calling you home right now, all right? <laughs> We've called one ambulance to the church already today. Let's not call another one. Uh, but it is, our, it is our forever home, and we ought to know something about where it is that we are going. And knowing about where we're going ought to impact the way we live between now and then. And so that's what we're spending our time looking at over the next several weeks. And last week, as uh, we took another step in this journey, we discovered a few things. And, and just way of review, let me hit a couple of key points. Last week, we discovered, according to what Paul wrote in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, keep seeking the things above, 
where Christ is. He is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. And what Paul is telling us is that while on this earth, we need to be intentional about choosing to think about heaven. It doesn't come natural because for a lot of us, we think it might get a little morbid thinking about heaven all the time. Well, I don't want heaven to be morbid. The process, the doorway to get there might be a little morbid. But when you arrive, it's going to be absolutely incredible. And Paul said there's benefit for us as we keep thinking and as we set our minds on things above. Just as many of you ladies have t-shirts that says, choose joy. Actually, right now, Bob is wearing a women's shirt over there. Called, Are you cold, Bob? Yeah. Okay, turn the, heater, turn the coolers up now just a little bit. It's horrible to see him in his wife's shirt, all right? Okay, good, yeah. You are right about that in a whole lot of ways, Bob. I knew you before she married you, all right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, just as we choose joy, choose to think about heaven. And then Peter wrote in his second letter, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the divine power of Christ has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which Christ has granted to us his precious and great promises, so that through them, the promises, we may become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world because of our sinful desires. You see, when we think about heaven, while on this earth, we should be intentional about living here the way we're going to be living there. So let me ask you a question. Do you think you'll be thinking about your sinful desires while you're in heaven? No. So stop thinking about them while you're here on earth. When those temptations come, the scripture says, Whatsoever things are good and right and just and pure, think on these things. We can't stop temptation from entering your mind, but you can stop temptation from controlling your mind. So begin to think and live here the way we're going to be living there. And then the knowledge of heaven should make a difference in our choices on earth. The idea of knowing that we are going to heaven should have influence on the way we live here. Dr. Robert Jeffries, pastor of Dallas uh, First Baptist Church and writer of a book on the subject of heaven, said in that book, the more we think about the next world, the more effective we become in this world. When we review the lives of men and women in the Old Testament who made the most profound impact on the world, people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah, we discover one common denominator. They were captivated by their hope in the next world. If you brought your Bibles with you or you have your, your uh, electronic devices with a Bible on it, I'm going to read uh, four verses from Hebrews chapter 11 verses 13 through 16 that validate for us what Pastor Jeffrey said, the more we think about the next world, the more effective we become in this world. Those of you who are familiar with the Bible some, um, not every chapter in the Bible has a name, but Hebrews chapter 11 does have a title given to it. What is that title? Yeah, the Hall of Fame of Faith is what Hebrews chapter 11 is known for. It is a New Testament book but it reviews Old Testament history. And in chapter 11, it's kind of a record of the Hall of Fame of Faith. And there are some really prominent names not mentioned, but they get covered by a sentence which says, there are too many for us to mention. <laughs> and, and then he goes on to talk about them. But Hebrews 11, 13 through 16 reads like this. All these people referring to these Old Testament saints, they were still living by faith when they died. Wouldn't you love to have that said about you when you die? Living by faith at the moment of their death. They did not receive the things promised. Now for the Old Testament folks, they did not get to see Jesus face to face. They did not get to see the Messiah arrive in the world. 
They didn't get to see the Messiah die for their sins. They didn't get to see the Messiah raised from the dead to transform their lives. That was still a hope in their future. They saw it from a distance, admitting that while they were in this world, they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Abraham could have gone back to Ur instead of inheriting the promised land. Instead, all of these were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. David, David wrote a significant portion of the Old Testament. And David yearned for this better country that the writer of Hebrews refers to as he talks about many Old Testament believers. In Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, Paul wrote these words, As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you? In your conversations with God, have you ever asked him that question? God, when do I get to come be with you? Or are you a little afraid to ask that question? In the New Testament, Paul struggled, and he talked about this on numerous occasions in different books that he wrote. Paul had two strong desires that, that welled up within him, and both of them were good desires. He defines it this way. He said, to depart for heaven as soon as possible or to remain on earth to finish the mission you have given me to do. Those were his two strong desires. Stay and be engaged in ministry, or die and go on to heaven. We often think that's a choice between good and bad. For Paul, he said, one choice is good, keep being involved in the mission you've called me to, or die and come be with you, and that's better. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and 8 says, Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. I, I prefer, Paul said, rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Paul realized that every minute spent alive on earth was a minute away from the home that Jesus had prepared for him in heaven. Paul believed that when he was born again, that he had made heaven his home. Earth was no longer his dwelling place. And Paul had come to a point in his life that he didn't want to spend one more minute than absolutely necessary on earth. Isn't that peculiar thinking? Most people today struggle to hold onto every minute they have on earth as if it is going to be their last. Paul said no. I've got many more breaths to take, but they'll be celestial breaths. <laughs> they'll be breathing perfect air of heaven. Y yet Paul realized that it was necessary to spend some time on earth to finish what God had, had wanted him to do in his life. And what was Paul doing? Guiding other people to heaven with him. Do you remember last week? Uh, at the beginning of the sermon, I showed you a clip of a vacation I'm going on this summer. If you weren't here last week, y'all missed it. Life sucks for you today. Uh, <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that on Mother's Day. That would have made, my mother hated it when I dropped that word every now and then. Ooh, sorry, Mom. Um, but, but I showed that video to you for a reason. It's because I'm, I'm excited about going. It's, it's an anticipation that I have in my future. And you know what happened since I showed that video last week? I bet I've had two dozen of you say, ooh, I want to go on that trip. Why can't we talk about heaven in the same way we talk about vacations? Why can't we talk about it in such a way that others say, I want to go with you when you go to heaven? See, to the Philippian Christians, Paul made this confession. 
He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In verses 23 and 24 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul goes on to say, but I'm hard pressed from both directions. I have a desire to depart and go be with Jesus for that is very, listen to this, that is very much better. Old Testament saints looking for a better country. Paul said for me to go to heaven is better, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul said for me to hang out on earth is important for some others because I can still tell them how to get to heaven. If you have ever visited the ancient catacombs underneath the city of Rome, I've never had the privilege of going. Someday I'd like to. Anybody here who you've been to the catacombs in Rome? You've been, oh, okay. You guys can tell me if what I'm about to say is true or not because I've only read about this. But I understand that there in the catacombs there are some beautiful painted heavenly scenes of landscapes. Children playing and feasting. And the tombs of the Christian martyrs who were buried there have some heavenly-minded inscriptions. Here's three of them that are there. One inscription says, In Christ, Alexander is not dead, but he lives. His body is resting in the grave. Another one says, He went to live with Jesus. Another inscription says, He was taken up into his eternal home. For the follower of Jesus... Death is moving from one place to another. It's like moving from the frozen tundra of the Arctic Circle to the sun-kissed beaches of Hawaii. Paul described a Christian's change of location at death as to be absent from the body and home with the Lord. For the follower of Jesus Christ, death is making the move. If heaven is our future home, why wouldn't we want to know all that we could possibly know about it? In just a little over six weeks, I'm going to be taking that vacation down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. On the way there, we're going to be going through Bishop, California, and St. George, Utah, and possibly a little side trip through Bryce Canyon. I've been looking at the map. I've been scouting routes to see what country I've never seen before. I've been looking at pictures of what I can anticipate to see when I get there. I've been investigating places to eat. <laughs> I'm looking for the local flavor places, man. If you got any in those places, let me know. Because I like to eat when I travel. I'm looking for places where we can spend the night. Not so much because I want it to be all that cool of a, a, of a room. What we found in Bishop was a, a motel that's right down by a river that flows right by the side of it. And they've got beautiful patio areas along the side. A great place for a fine cylindrical object. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a cigar. Okay, God created the leaf of the plant. And so I'm exploring information about where I'm going because I want to know what it's like on the journey there and I want to enjoy it. And do, do you know what this, this information is doing for me? It's creating more anticipation for the trip. It's energizing me as I come to work every day. It's elevating my hope for the trip. My expectations are getting bigger and bigger. It increases my love to talk about my trip with other people. And as I talk about it with other people, they're saying, I want to go. I didn't know I was going to have 15-foot waves in some places on the Colorado River till I saw the video. I can't, I'm so stoked. <laughs> and that brings, and, and I can hardly wait for launch date to arrive. Those things that vacations do for us is what I hope the study of heaven will do for all of us. Just as my study on our vacation destination does not reveal everything we're going to see or experience on the trip, the Bible doesn't tell us everything about our future home. What the Bible does reveal about heaven is true, but it's not exhaustive. 
It's kind of like God has given to us a pencil sketch of our drawing of our future home. For example, the Apostle Paul received a personal tour of heaven when he was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4 talks about it. Yet Paul, this man who wrote most of the New Testament, never jotted down one pen stroke of what he heard or saw in heaven. And why? Because what he heard and saw, according to verse 4, were inexpressible words and visions which a man is not permitted to speak. And though John the Apostle, who was given the most extensive vision of the future of any Christian, and he wrote about part of it in the book of Revelation, there were some aspects of what John saw that he was commanded in Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, seal it up and do not write about them. You wonder why is it God doesn't tell us everything there is to know about heaven? May I make a couple of suggestions? First, God knows that our minds are incapable of fully comprehending the complete magnificence of heaven. For example, how could you ever adequately describe the beauty of a sunset to a blind person who's never ever seen color ever at all? How could you sign language to a deaf person and capture the sounds of majesty of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? That's like God whose ways are so much higher than our ways as the mountains are above the seas. Additionally, I think if we knew everything about heaven, we would be, it would be hard for us to concentrate on our God-given mission here on earth. I, I know this sounds like a contradiction to what I've said earlier about being heavenly minded makes us more earthly good, but, but, but sometimes it's not. Let me explain. If we knew the whole story, we might try to rush getting there. And I don't think we should ever do that. But let me use this as an illustration. Suppose you sit your child down at the dinner table and a good mom that you are, you place in front of your child a plate of lima beans that they really do love. I love lima beans, all right? This is my story, okay? <laughs> but, but, but when mom places the, the, the plate of lima beans there, she also puts in front of her son a bowl of vanilla ice cream smothered in strawberries and whipped cream. This is my story, so it's not chocolate or fudge, okay? This is strawberries. Which one do you think the child will want to eat first? Strawberries and ice cream, yeah. The same thing you and I would want to eat, the sundae. However, the boy sits there with his plate of lima beans and his mother promises him an ice cream sundae after he eats his beans, what's he going to do? Dive into that plate of lima beans with gusto, knowing something better is yet to come. And if God told us everything about heaven, we'd find it difficult to focus on the important mission God has for us in our brief stay on earth. That is why God has given us enough information about heaven to whet our appetites for the Sunday that is yet to come. The fact that God has given us only a glimpse of heaven shouldn't discourage us from discovering everything we can about our future home. Life is about much more than 70 plus years we might spend here on this earth. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Our life here on earth is important. The choices we make, the character we form, the affections we develop now will impact our lives on the other side of the grave. As the fictitious Roman general turned gladiator Maximus Decimus Meridius told his men, what we do in life echoes in eternity. There's not very many of you, but a few of you who are here will remember my, my in-laws, uh, Ted and Carrie. How, any of you, how many of you here remember Ted and, Ted and Carrie? All right, just a few of you. Um, if, if you would have asked me in 1990 uh, who was going to live the longest, my, my, my mom and dad, Lonnie and June, or Ted and Carrie, I would have said Ted and Carrie would have outlasted my mom and dad. They had no health issues at the time. Mom, mom and dad did. Ted and Carrie were 64 years of age. And Ted got diagnosed with uh, a brain tumor, a glioblastoma, uh, glioblastoma class four brain tumor. And um, that happened on a Wednesday evening. He was coming to the church to install some new software on my computer that he said would help me with my sermon prep. And I was excited to get it because he's the one who taught me how to use a computer. Before he could get here that night, he couldn't talk. They rushed him to the hospital, and after a CAT scan, it was discovered that um, 
He had a brain tumor. They got him to San Francisco for more tests, and we met with the team up there. They told us the, the chances of Ted living five years or more was 3% if we did nothing. The chance of him living five years or more if we did something was 3%. Ted said, if there's something you can do that you can learn that will help others down the road, then let's do it. So they did a procedure back then called mapping, and they removed as much as the tumor as they could. And it gave Ted about three or four good months. And, um, and then the tumor was back. And he passed away about six months and two weeks after diagnosis. When we went back to the hospital after they'd done the surgery and he had recuperated about three weeks, we went back up to get the reports of what they thought the prognosis would be and the success of the surgery. The surgeon was very straightforward, compassionate but very straightforward and said, uh, what we did worked, but we can't get, there were too many fingers that we couldn't get to that still are in your brain. And they told us then we were looking at two to three months. We went down to a cafeteria to process everything they had told us, and Ted looks at his wife and his daughter, and they have tears going down their face. And he looked at them with a big smile on his face, and Ted said, Ted said to his wife and his daughter, don't you dare cry for me. This is what I've lived my life for. It's what I've taught Bible study so much for. I'm prepared for heaven. Don't shed a tear for me. I didn't expect that, but it didn't surprise me either, knowing Ted the way I knew him. I learned a lot about how I want to face death from that moment. Had no idea that six weeks later, I was going to find out that um, my mother-in-law had leukemia. And that four and a half months after that, she would go to heaven as well. When I sat with her in the oncologist's office getting the news that she had leukemia, I did not expect that my mother-in-law was kind of the worry wart in the family. I didn't expect to hear what I heard from her that day. She got a big smile on her face. She looked at the doctor and she said, you know, I wondered what God was going to do with me. She said, I knew my, my mission in life was to be my husband's helpmate. I provided a home and an environment and resources for him to teach God's word. My job is done. And we watch Carrie face her closing moments in the same way we watch Ted face his. And I've never forgotten those things. You see, what we do in life echoes in eternity. It really does. Nevertheless, our existence beyond death deserves our serious thoughts and considerations. As the Roman philosopher Seneca put it, this life is only a prelude to eternity. C.S. Lewis wrote about this in his book series called The Chronicles of Narnia. How many of you here have read the children's series of books called The Chronicles of Narnia? Raise your hand. Okay, I got news for the rest of y'all. You are not too old to read them yet. I was an adult before I read any of them, all right? It's a wonderful series to read. And so I would encourage you, pick it up. But, but the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, it's a, uh, Lewis had this idea about children's books. If, if adults didn't enjoy them, he didn't do a good job writing them. And so the story, it's, a, it's about four children uh, in England who find a closet that lets them into another world called Narnia, and they go back and forth between uh, England and Narnia. And it's kind of like the physical life and the spiritual life kind of what the story is about. The, can, can any idea what the last book is called? The Last Battle. And it's really about going home. It's about dying. Let's jump into the, uh, Aslan, do you all know who Aslan is? Aslan's the lion. He's the picture of Jesus in the story. They're involved in a train wreck. They all meet Aslan in Narnia. Listen to what Aslan says to them. There was a real railway accident today. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you called it in the Shadowlands, you're dead. 
Your semester is over. The holiday's begun. The dream has ended, and this is morning. And as Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen were so great and beautiful that I cannot write about them. And for us, this is the end of all their stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they're beginning chapter 1. Chapter 1 of this great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and ever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Do you get it? Better than the one before. The four benefits of being heavenly minded on this earth is that it reminds us of the brevity of life here. And David talked about that in Psalm 39, 4 and 5. Focusing on heaven prepares us for the certainty of judgment. I've told you if you've been here before, I don't fully understand this, but in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says that some point, at some time in heaven, we all stand before a judgment seat. We're already in heaven, but we're going to be made aware of what our life was really like on earth, and it's going to be dealt with. Number three, focusing on heaven should motivate us to live pure lives on earth. Peter talks about that in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12 that I read earlier. If, if, if our wedding date is on a calendar and we're thinking about the person we're going to marry, it should not be very easy for somebody to seduce us, should it? If you're occupied with the thought of who you're going to marry, we shouldn't be drawn away by somebody else. But unfortunately... Our high tolerance for sin testifies of our failure to prepare for heaven. And last of all, focusing on heavenly places adds a perspective to suffering like no other. And we'll take a closer look at that down the road. Let me wrap this up. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, we're informed, we are enlightened, we are challenged with the idea that heaven is better. Somehow we've got to get that from truth to belief in our own lives. Some of you have heard me tell this before. That, that there was a young woman who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. She had been given three months to live, and so she was getting her affairs in order. She called her pastor, and she had him come over to her house to discuss some aspects of, of what her final wishes were. She told him which song she wanted sung at the service and what scripture she would like to have him read. She also told him, this is the outfit that I want you to make sure I'm buried in. This is my Bible. I want you to make sure that it's with me. He got ready to leave. And she said, oh, pastor, I almost forgot something. And this is very important. There's one more thing I want you to do for me, one other detail. He said, what's that? He said, she said, I want to make sure that you put a fork in my right hand. My Bible in my left, a fork in my right. The pastor looked at the young lady, not quite sure what to say about that request. He said, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And she said, this kind of surprises you, doesn't it? She said, well, to be honest, I'm puzzled about the request. The young woman explained, my grandmother once told me this story, and from that time on, I've always tried to pass along its message to those that I love and those who are in need of encouragement. In all of my years of attending socials and dinners, I always remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared away, somebody would inevitably lean over and say, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. And I always knew dessert was on its way. So I just want people to see me right there in my casket, my Bible in one hand and a fork in the other, and I want them to wonder, what's up with the fork? The pastor's eyes welled up with tears as he hugged the young woman and he said goodbye. And at her service, people walked by her casket before the service started and the pastor smiled as he heard many of them say, what's up with the fork? And during the sermon, 
he was able to tell her that this young lady wanted all of them to know that her best was still ahead of her. Your best is still ahead of you and me. It's called heaven. Are we ready? And do we talk about it in such a way that other folks want to go with us? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the, so much for the, the bits of information that you give us about our eternal home. Thank you for the interest that's been generated about wanting to know about this place where we're going. But Father, I pray it will not just be a journey of facts, but it will be genuinely a journey that piques our interest, creates greater hope, fills us with excitement, and drives away all of our fears. Heaven is what you've prepared for us. I pray we are prepared for you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Happy Mother's Day.